I rode in this boat before I was born, in utero, as they say, so I've known it for a long time. It's, it's part of my being, I guess. Well, this boat was built in 1926, August 26, in Port Carling, and my aunt bought it. She was the proprietor of this uh, small uh, summer resort, and the boat was used for many, many years, right up into the mid-1950s, to ferry the guests and their luggage and food, everything, back and forth from Port Carling, where the steamer dock was. There's been a long boat building tradition in Muskoka, and it is believed that the first white person to actually build a boat here was William J. Johnson, Sr., and the story goes that he built this boat. It was a rowboat, and it was a dugout, in fact. He built it in a barn in 1868. Eventually, the Johnsons got into boat building in a very big way in Port Carling. And, of course, the ditch burns in Rosso were doing the same thing. They were building boats in a house. They built them upstairs and had to slide them down out of the window to get them down to the ground. Probably by around 1900, the Johnsons themselves had 300 rowboats. That's a lot of boats, you know. I mean, you try to store that many in the fall. Because of the fact that there were a lot of quite wealthy Americans coming to Muskoka from places like Pittsburgh and Cleveland and Detroit. Muskoka wasn't as backward uh, technologically as people might think. And when gasoline engines were first coming in at the beginning of the 20th century, it wasn't very long until there were gasoline-driven launches. My family's first launch was built in 1903, and it was built by the Toronto Launch Company, and the motor was built by the Toronto Gasoline Engine Company. So I think that says it all. <laughs> and I know my grandmother said that when they used to use the boat, um, they basically paddled it. And my great-grandfather was so tired of everyone making fun of him having this launch, he gave all his daughters, because he had four daughters, um, fake names. So like my grandmother, whose name was Louise, was called Violet. And he would say, Violet paddled harder as they were going through the cut in Port Sandfield because he didn't want the people that he knew in the hotel to make fun of him anymore. <laughs> in the early days, you got gasoline from a chemist and you'd buy it in bottles. But as time went on, gas was uh, transported around the lake in, in barrels. There was lots of very fine launch builders um, throughout the province, through the, the states, wherever. But what happened was here you had waters that were kind to boats. Um, we don't have the tremendous changes in water levels. We don't have the same problems with ice. And you have a lot of people who have been here for a long, long time. The best mark of boats, I think, was Manette Shields. Bert Manette was a son of the person who started Cleveland's house and he was an incredible workman. He was known as being unbelievably fastidious in everything he did, and he was just doing them so much better than anybody else did. The best way of explaining it is that the builders here built uh, boats with what they called a piano finish, meaning it was four, five, six coats of varnish, absolutely superb. A launch that you would buy in 1929, you could buy a house for in North Toronto same price. When the Dippy came along, it was sort of hailed as the Model T of the waterways. And so the Dippies were basically glorified motorized rowboats. So a company was formed in the spring of 1916, and it took over the W.J. Johnson Boat Works in Port Carling. The problem with boats in those days was that logging was still going on in Muskoka. These deadheads were constantly floating around in the lake and they would move from one day to the next depending on what the wind did with them. And you could be uh, happily jogging along out in the middle of the lake and all of a sudden, bang, you'd hit something that was perhaps just six inches under the water. This 
device, as they call it, disappearing propeller device, had a protecting skeg under the thing so that it was automatic, so that if you were going along and you hit a rock or one of these deadheads that we were talking about earlier, the thing would automatically come up and 99% of the time it wouldn't do any damage to the propeller. And you can see how it all articulates here. It's really quite amazing. So these engines were rocket science more or less in their day as far as engines were concerned. Most engines in uh, boats at that time, marine engines, weighed roughly a hundred pounds per horsepower. This is a three horsepower engine and it weighs 39 pounds. Turn the grease cups, just the mixture, ignition on and here we go, maybe. Oh, a rip. I'm lonely and blue and I'm longing for you. Come where we'll be. In a dippy, you can't go fast anyway because they only go six miles an hour, so you might as well sit back and enjoy the ride. And it's an absolutely marvelous way to travel. Come take a trip in my dippy dip dip over the lake so blue. Go for a ride. Cuddle close to my side, tell me your love is true. Though stormy or calm the weather, we'll travel along together. So come take a trip in my dippy dip dip, and I'll tell my love to you. No trouble we'll know in my little dispro. Under the stars up above Gently sailing along Like the tune of a song No better place to make love The company uh, became by the early 1920s, the largest motorboat building enterprise in the British Empire. It is said that uh, practically every able-bodied man in the community uh, had winter work there. If you weren't working in the bush cutting firewood to stay warm, you worked in the DP factory. And by 1926, they had produced over 2,000 boats in this factory. If you could somehow figure out how to do things on an assembly line basis, then you could really make a lot of money. And that was the idea behind the dippy, but the only fallacy in that was that a dippy is a hand-built wooden boat, and you can't mass produce woodworking skills. They did the best they could. They cut, they had one person doing cutting out all the planking and somebody else would do all the ribbing and somebody else would do the nailing. But still there were these skills involved and no two boats turned out the same. It wasn't as though they were being stamped out by a machine. 